How exactly will a new plan to rule all Sri Lankan communities under one law effectively represent everyone, while also trying to help heal divisions within society? The decision to appoint a Buddhist monk to oversee these sweeping reforms is stoking controversy. This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahalbarra. Sri Lanka has a long history of ethnic and religious tensions, and with the new plan, President Gotabaya Rajapaksa hopes to heal those divisions by carrying out a series of reforms. He has just appointed a task force to establish a blanket system for all communities. The so-called One Country, One Law concept aims to end discrimination across Sri Lanka. But the panel will be headed by a controversial Buddhist monk known for his anti-Muslim stance. He'll be leading a 13-member committee that includes four Muslims' representatives, but no Tamils. Muslims make up almost 10% of Sri Lanka's 22 million people, who are predominantly Sinhalese Buddhists. Gotabaya was elected in 2019 with the backing of the Buddhist majority. Critics say the president promoted the plan during his presidential campaign to secure their support. President Gutabaya's proposal for legal reforms gained significant momentum after the Easter suicide bomb attacks in 2019. More than 250 people were killed in a series of well-coordinated attacks on churches and hotels. The incident was blamed on an ISIL-linked group. Since then, there's been an uptick in mob violence against Muslims in the island nation. Rights groups say the Muslim minority suffered from consistent harassment over the years as sentiment for Sinhala Buddhist nationalism grew. The Tamil minority has also played a part in these tensions. Separatists from the community fought a violent insurgency against government forces for decades until the civil war ended in 2009. We'll get to our guests shortly, but first, Minel Fernandez reports from Colombo. People are waiting to see what exactly this means, the presidential task force on one country, one law, as it's being described, uh, is something that the president says will be required to look and review existing laws as well as to recommend and draft new laws that feed into this concept of one country, one law. That is very much in keeping with one of the pillars of Gotabe Rajapaksa's presidential campaign. Uh, to bring the entire country under one umbrella. Now, for minorities, obviously, uh, they're looking at this with kind of mixed feelings, waiting to see what exactly it contains and what exactly the government's plans are. One concern, though, right at the outset, is the leadership of that presidential task force, a controversial figure. A notorious monk has been appointed as the chairperson of this uh, task force, which is extremely worrying because this monk has been uh, instigating violence against uh, minorities in the country in the past and was in the forefront of some of these uh, terror, I mean, racist attacks that happened uh, around the country in the past. In the last few weeks, he has come on state media and has been talking about a new uh, set of attacks that may happen in Sri Lanka, which is extremely worrying because a person who has been delegated executive powers, this, this looks as if President uh, Gotabe Rajapaksha has delegated his executive powers onto this notorious monk. So it's very worrying as a, as, as a civilian in Sri Lanka as to uh, what could happen in the future. So as indicated by the TNA parliamentarian, uh, the inclusion right at the head of this task force of a controversial uh, Buddhist monk is something that has sent concerns among the minorities uh, about the kind of exact bona fides of what the government is trying to do. Now for most minorities, what they had been asking for and calling for is that every single citizen, no matter what race, what religion, uh, is treated as equal before the law. It should not depend on who he or she is connected to, what religion he or she follows, uh, or what sort of political ideology. And that is the concern that the government will have to allay. Now, we did ask the government 
uh, for a comment or a reaction to, to answer some questions. But at this stage, uh, they did say they are still sort of reviewing this new um, sort of gazette and things like that, that they would comment at a later stage. But for minorities, they are waiting to see. Now, Sri Lanka has always been a diverse uh, fabric of communities that have lived side by side for centuries. And this has also been its strength. So what it's hoping that this is not going to be uh, one country, one law, where all that unique difference is forced to be sort of, you know, second to a majoritarian kind of law. But the government will have to allay these fears. Bina Fernandez, Inside Story, Colombo. Let's bring in our guests in Colombo, Bevani Fonesca, senior researcher at the Center for Policy Alternatives. In Nottingham, Tamil Anatavinayagan is lecturer in the International Human Rights Law at University of Nottingham. Also in Colombo, Shireen Abdesaru, who is also co-founder of Women's Action Network. Welcome to the program. Bavani, let's talk about the one country, one law concept. Is it an attempt by the government or by Rajapaksa in particular, to bring all the nation under one legal code, irrespective of their religious uh, identities and ethnic affiliations. Thank you for having me. So we realized a few hours ago um, that the government, the president, has issued a gazette appointing this presidential task force. And one looks at the mandate of the task force, and it's very clear it's to take forward this policy of one country, one law. Now, there are a couple of issues one needs to factor in. This is not a new thing. We've heard this since 2019 with the election manifesto of Gotabe Rajapaksa. And since he came into office as well, we've heard this uh, continuous um, uh, rhetoric of a one country, one law policy. So it's not new. What's new is that it's now being driven through this task force and this culture of task forces. That's one aspect. Mm -hmm. The other is the composition of the task force, which is headed by a very divisive Buddhist monk. There's a whole history to uh, his background and what he has done in the past, but also very seriously, He's been convicted for contempt of court of the highest court in Sri Lanka. So there's a lot of issues around this. But fundamentally, the question is, why do we need this task force? And what's the purpose of this task force at this moment? Okay. And it looks to... That's, that, 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 that's really the, the question that everyone is asking, Tamil. Yeah. Why would you need this particular law now when you have a diverse nations such as Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, Hassan, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here as well. Um, I mean, to echo what Bhavani just said, uh, the point is that uh, um, Rajapaksha and his family um, ran on this very electoral base, and they are just uh, giving back what the electoral base wants, namely to establish a Sinhalese legal hegemony in uh, the country in an atmosphere of um, majoritarianism um, that is deeply entrenched in Sri Lanka for decades. Um, and it's interesting enough that they are using and doing it now uh, when they are at the very crossfire with the United Nations. Please consider and uh, be aware that um, Sri Lanka has a vibrant interaction with uh, the United Nations human rights machinery. And uh, the United Nations had, uh, on different occasions in 2014 and 2017, before the UN Human Rights Treaty bodies, uh, asked to either amend or repeal personal laws like the Disavamale law, the Tamil uh, personal laws, but also the Muslim laws. Um, but uh, the interesting thing now is that international human rights law is rather used as a Trojan horse to introduce Singalese legal hegemony that is now playing and penders towards the electoral base in the country. Mm -hmm. Shireen, usually when you want to sell a law to the people or you, when you want to win the hearts and minds, you bring about someone who can build bridges. The choice of Gal Godata Nyanansera has been 
absolutely controversial from day one. Why do you think the Rajapaksa is putting the monk uh, to, to lead this committee? Uh, because uh, I think Rajapaksha's politics is now, it's about uh, provoking anti-Muslim sentiment. And that is the only uh, way forward for them to continue with this uh, country. Right now, country is almost collapsing with regard to economy. The constituency that elected Rajapaksha uh, based on the singular Buddhist ideology that uh, they talked about because the slogan of one country, one law is Rajapaksha campaign. So the, the president is becoming very unpopular. In the context of that, we see that this is all about anti-Muslim rhetoric again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bhavani, when you look at the, the, the supporters of the, uh, of the new panel, they will tell you that basically you have personal laws which are discriminating against women in Sri Lanka, failing to address domestic violence against women or the issue of forced marriages. And therefore, it's about time to have one legal code that will be... Uh, the fundamental law in Sri Lanka. And for this particular reason, what Rajapaksa is doing is genuine and justified. Well, I think the question to ask is, why is it being done by a task force? Um, and I think for those who are not aware of it, there are several committees set up by the Minister for Justice. The Minister of Justice has several committees looking at law reform. And the lawmaking process, there's a particular system, a structure in Sri Lanka. So are we now saying a task force headed by a Buddhist monk is the best way forward in terms of law reform in Sri Lanka? Any law reform, it, not just about gender, but any laws should be drafted by a task force and headed by someone who has no legal background. Now, I think that's one question to ask. The other one is, we also have experts that have been looking at MMDA and other issues, and there are reports. So what is this new initiative going to add to it? So there are a lot of questions, I would say, as a lawyer, mm -hmm. I have in terms of a task force being given this mandate. And I think that that's something that really needs to be questioned. Tamil, you have the issue of uh, universal human rights at the same time, and you have cultural relativism, minorities, particularly the Tamils and the Muslims, are saying that this government has to understand that our culture is to be respected. The government is saying that we adhere to an international order that is more in favour of implementing universal human rights. Uh, how do you respond to this? Well, Hashan, thank you very much for this question. Um, I mean, to echo uh, Bhavani um, as well here again, um, and uh, unravel this a little bit further. Um, th the point of the matter is Sri Lanka is a post-colonial um, country, um, and uh, it has inherited many of the Malays uh, that uh, the country had inherited from the British colonizers and the Portuguese and the Dutch. Uh, so there is an amalgam of cultures, religion, uh, traditions in the country existent. Um, but using this argument of now universalizing human rights, something that uh, Sri Lanka or the Sri Lanka lawmakers have always opposed, now using it for their own purpose to further uh, rather legal hegemony and completely marginalizing and liquidating the identities of a multicultural country um, is uh, completely contrary to the point. Um, I'm coming from a scholarship which is called the Third World Approaches to International Law. And we have to con consider the manifold narratives that are existent in the, sh in the country rather than abolishing them. And that is the purpose right now of this task force. It's entrenching legal hegemony, cultural hegemony, but also further expanding uh, the presidency of uh, Rajapaksha. Um, and that is a great threat. Uh, and being someone who is ethnically Tamil, mm -hmm. we don't see any uh, Tamil representation as well on the task force. Um, and uh, as, as usual, these task forces are running on the concept of um, representation of the majority with some token uh, representatives from the minorities. This is the usual tactic that has been um, employed uh, in post-colonial Sri Lanka. Shireen, the general sentiment among Muslims is that this is an attempt to implement a Buddhist supremacist uh, rule in Sri Lanka. What would be next move for the Muslim community in Sri Lanka? 
uh, it's very difficult because it's coming at a time, as you pointed out, this Muslim personal law reform has been uh, discussed and the women for the last 40 years have been fighting uh, for this reform. And it's also very interestingly, this particular committee can also look at the draft laws act that have been uh, drafted and some of the amendments that are being done by the justice ministry. So it's very tough for many of us who have been fighting for women's rights, children's rights in this country, equality before law and all, and where this uh, you know, uh, uh, convicted uh, extremist uh, criminal has been brought in as the head of the committee. And it's very difficult to challenge this also to moving forward because the president uh, has appointed this task force, many other task forces also he has appointed uh, because the 20th amendment gives him that power. And I don't know whether we'll be able to go to Supreme Court on the cassette itself, but when the committee, this particular committee suggests thing, maybe probably we will be able to challenge those things. And I'm also thinking that this is not only the Muslim personal law reform per se, but also there are other things that are on the chopping board of madras abolishing madrasas, banning um, burqas, um, halal food, uh, and then uh, scrutiny of Arabic script, uh, uh, you know, and also Arabic translation, and more recently ban of uh, cow uh, slaughtering, all these things, uh, and also radicalization, uh, that is uh, that came as a gasset again, uh, 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 which we challenged it. Uh, and uh, probably there is a possibility of them bringing in de-radicalization process also uh, into this, uh, this particular committee. So it's very complex and we need to legally move, you know, challenge this whatever possible way. At the same time, uh, we have the Muslim uh, MPs who have crossed over and given uh, uh, Rajapaksha's this 20th Amendment, mm -hmm. the power that he is abusing now against Muslims. So it is those Muslim MPs who crossed over uh, has to look into this very clearly. Bhavani, is it the Buddhist nationalist sentiment which has paved the way to these drastic changes that we're seeing in the society? Or was it the 2019 attacks that was the moment for Rajapaksa to say, it's my moment to implement the reforms or the policies I would like to implement? So I think it's very important to look at our recent history. The Easter Sunday attacks is, I think, what everyone is aware of in 2019. But the attacks against the Muslim community goes back years, in a way, decades. But the more recent attacks in the post-war uh, period, actually, you've seen attacks in 2014, 2018, specific incidents where one particular Buddhist monk is linked to these incidents. Now, if you look at that incident and the individual, that particular individual now is heading a, a task force. So there is a particular culture that has been built, an impunity that one individual enjoys under the Rajapaksa regime. Now, this task force merely legitimizes his role, the impunity he enjoys, but also sends a message to the minorities in this country that they are second-class citizens, that the majority community, and particularly Buddhist monks who are known and there's evidence of incitement, can get away with so much. Not just that, not just the incitement and the racism. Mm -hmm. This is an individual who's been convicted for contempt of court. So by a, appointing him to this particular task force, the president is sending a direct message that he doesn't care about the judicial process. He doesn't care about the lawmaking process. So it has huge implications as to what the president has done he may have issued just a gazette, but the implications mm -hmm. are long term and ha can set Sri Lanka back in so many ways. And that needs to be recognized and taken on. And Shreen's point about challenge, that's an important point. Tamil, the international community has been very critical of the atrocities committed against the Tamil to the point where they were asking for the government to take uh, concrete steps to reach out to the Tamil and to heal the wounds of the civil war. Now, by excluding a Tamil or Tamils from this task force. Is the government or is Rajapaksa inciting ethnic, religious animosities once again? 
Indeed. I mean, uh, the current president was spearheading. He was the architect of the end of the war, um, of the civil war that lasted for 26 years uh, in 2009. Um, and uh, not including now the Tamils, although the Rajapaksha family is uh, making uh, so-called efforts by speaking Tamil in public or uh, pretending to care for the Tamil issues on various fronts. Um, the, the non-nomination of a Tamil to this uh, task force, which is uh, just only, um, you know, uh, circumventing the usual legal process, um, is just undercutting uh, and undermining any credibility um, in his presidency from the perspective of the Tamils. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, as we have pointed out, uh, Nyana Seratero um, is uh, spearheading anti-Muslim hate, but also anti-Tamil hate uh, in the country. And this very task force is the symbol of division. Mm -hmm. It is uh, just stipulating uh, a new legal empire um, that favors the majority and that uh, just sidelines the minorities in the country uh, and is not leading any way to uh, real reconciliation. The United Nations and the international organizations mm -hmm. have tried to strive for reconciliation on many occasions. I don't want to, I don't want to go into the details of such, mm -hmm. but um, the failure is evident. Uh, we don't okay. see reconciliation, non-nomination of a Tamil is evidence. Shireen, since 2019, these are some of the decisions made by the president and which were widely seen as anti-Muslims, uh, particularly the uh, ban on burqa, ban on madrasas, imposing mandatory cremation policy for the COVID-19 dead and refusing to allow Muslims to bury their dead according to their uh, religion. Uh, is, this, is this interpreted by Muslims as an indication that the government, or Rajapaksa in particular, is adamant in his anti-Muslim stance? Definitely. I mean, we are made to feel that uh, we are no more citizen of this country. It's, it's a form of, uh, you know, um, minority communities in this country feel that they are third grade citizens and we have to stomach what the majority singular Buddhism say to us. If we don't, uh, we have to get out. So the whole one country, one uh, one law is all about it's a Buddhist state. This is what President said his inaugural mm -hmm. speech. This is a singular a Buddhist state that I am a, a president elected by single Buddhist and I will serve them, but I will look after the minority as well. So this is very clearly indicated in his inaugural speech. He is implementing that ever since he took over the office. And also very interestingly, all these task force that he has been appointing uh, either military men or the clergymen, and also the women's uh, representation is missing. President mm -hmm. not only is intimidating the minority, but also the country's women are left out in any of the legislative process or being part of whatever the consultation that he is he has been doing. So it's also very interesting because at a time when women from various minority communities have been also in the forefront articulating for various reforms and the president come up with this task force uh, with a conservative men, criminals, and also uh, the military men. And also in this particular task force, we don't know who this, these Muslims are also. Uh, so, I mean, it can be a one section of the Muslim community. This also can divide the Muslim community into pieces because if you, if president is giving only one section of the Muslim community, one sect, uh, and the other rest of the community is being vilified uh, in the name of following Wahhabism or very, various conservative thing, it's very problematic because not uh, too long ago, Nyanasar uh, uh, Mong told uh, in the public media that it is Allah who is the reason why uh, terrorism is happening all over the world. Uh, and Thank and you. so Thank you, in that context... <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Sorry. we're running out of time. Uh, Shireen Abdel Saroor, yeah. Tamil Vintan, Anata Vinayagan and Bhavani Funeska, I really appreciate your insight. Thank you. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website aljazeera.com for further discussion. Go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashem Ahbala, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now. <laughs>